Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast. I'm your host, David Higgins. I'm so glad you're with us again today. And uh, we have such an exciting conversation. Uh, we're going to look inside the hood of a nonprofit, ask some questions. Now, this might be your nonprofit we'll be looking inside the hood of. And so I hope the questions actually make you think. They're like, oh, wow, is that something we need to consider? Or, you know, that's something we can even improve in. Uh, that would give us great value on this side of the podcast because that's why we're here to serve you. And so I really hope this conversation we're about to have is something not only you enjoy, but you really causes your brain to go click. And that'll be pretty exciting. This episode is brought to you by the book, Demystifying Fundraising Funnels. It is a digital marketing blueprint to fund your nonprofit. And if you're looking at how to transition your nonprofit from just tactile fundraising into what is really where the money is is and revenue is actually exchanging in a much larger way in this day and age that is online and that is using not just your website uh, to raise funds and understanding how the google ad grant works within that it's also understanding how to use modern technologies and marketing like uh, click funnels and uh, drop funnels and these other ideas how to use them to raise money for your nonprofit, how to maximize your time you spend on social media and cause it to become a communication connection for you and your community. Did you know that 65% of your community is looking for you online? They're not looking for a flyer. They're not seeing your sign on the street. They're actually looking for you online. And we want to help you build that conversation so that they see you, that your mission is heard, your message is felt, and they feel like they can run next to you. So pick up that book wherever books are sold, Amazon, Target, Audible, eBooks. You get it. You read it. Let us know what you think about it. Well, today I have a single question for you in your nonprofit. Is your nonprofit systems being built for managing crisis or managing success? We know that we always have to deal with a certain element of crisis in every nonprofit. And sometimes we take our systems that we operate on, we communicate on, and, we, and we, that becomes a norm for us. And we, after a while, find ourselves trapped and being suffocated by the fact that we are wanting to dream and want to go big, but it's about the day-to-day. -day. It's about dealing with the urgent that's always going on. And our systems have molded themselves around that sense of missional survival. But today we're going to talk about how to break out of that and how to move into this place of having systems that are based on your long-term success, how to shift from surviving day-to-day -day for, to shifting to, uh, for the long-term. And not only being able to see how to do that with using online tools, but just the practical administration of your nonprofit. So I'm going to ask you a little question, a little thing to wake up your mind. The word, you know, philanthropy and the word communications. There's an intersection where being a philanthropist or being working inside of the world of charities and, and nonprofits and the area of communications is an intersection that we want to work Harm, is in a place of harmony between the two. And that intersection is so important for us as leaders of our nonprofits, as our visionaries, as the founders, to be able to find that connection and be able to live there. And so that merging point is really either something we stumble through trying to get, or we learn how to pace ourselves inside of. If you take this word where, uh, where philanthropy communications connect, there's a little term they use for that. That term is called, and I am looking for my term, Philcom. That's the word I was looking for. I had a little brain glitch. I was talking too fast and too much. My brain wasn't keeping up with me. But Philcom is that place where those two things merge. And out of that has come a industry and a business and a coaching method that I really think is going to be a great help to you. Our guest today has a Master of Science and Management in Nonprofit Leadership, a graduate certificate in teaching and learning, and is certified um, as a fundraising executive and is an association of fundraising professionals and master trainer. Her name is Tracy, and she is not just a blogger. She is a very good blogger that's picked up by a lot of people out there. She takes what she knows and what she's experienced. She puts it in writing form so we can learn with her. Um, for M the uh, Nonprofit Pro, which is a blogging format that I follow, as well as a number of others. She's a 
personal fundraising coach for Network for Good. And I'm pretty sure you know all about Network for Good because I know they're in my inbox all the time. I'm on their website an awful lot. And for the last seven years, she's been the president of Philcom. Philcom is an incredible um, coaching uh, support system for nonprofits throughout the nation, especially on the East Coast. But I want to just welcome Tracy Vandernick to the Nonprofit Podcast. Tracy, it is so good to have you with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Matt, you're talking to me all the way from Bradenton, Florida. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yes. So our, our winter here today is in the 60s. It's, uh, and that's about as far as we go. I'm I'm jealous. We had 18 <laughs> inches of snow four weeks ago, and it's oh. still sitting outside my window here. In my oh office. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was telling my wife, I want to move to Florida. I want to move to Florida. You know, <laughs> work took me to Tampa Bay for a couple of years, um, flying in and out of Tampa Bay. And I got to admit, during the winter times, it was nice to be there. Absolutely, and I'm about an hour from there, so that's that's the region I'm in on the West Coast. Wonderful. So. One of the things that when Hurricane, I think it was Sandy, came through about um, four years ago, I think that's the name of it. Ir Irma, probably. Was it Irma? It probably. came, it swung around the panhandle and started coming up the uh, Gulf side. Yes. And I was in Tampa Bay when that happened, and I watched all the water out of the bay get sucked out for a day and a half. And for the first time, people were looking at nothing but mud flats. Ooh, I have weird. lived in Florida my almost my entire life, and I've I had never seen that before that happened. It happened down here in Sarasota Bay as well, and it is that was a freaky phenomenon to see for sure. Yeah, uh, at one point I was actually on like the ninth floor of the Hilton, which you could see through out to you know through the cracks of the buildings into the water, and mm -hmm. you start seeing it turning brown, right? And you're waiting for something to come back in. You know, like there are people hypothesizing that water surge coming back in and, and what it would do and if what it's going to look like yes yeah and but slowly over it back up. It yes very non-dramatic yes it was uh it was a very strange sight though for for those of us who have never seen that happen before there's a lot of trash in that bay in tampa bay i have to tell you uh yes that that is that is probably true florida is um could do better at our environmental um, care of, of our region, that's for sure. Well, there are a bunch of pirates that live there, so, you know, you drink that beer. <laughs> that's true. They, 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 do their, they do their own thing and act however they want, yes. <laughs> now, you being a Florida girl, you're a whole life, from what I understand, is that right? For the most part. I lived away for about 10 years, um, but, but yes. Well, your education and your continuing education took you up to Vermont and even to Boston, right? Is that what I understand? Uh, New Hampshire. New Hampshire? Uh, New Hampshire, and, and yes. Uh -huh. So you got to see the leaves change on trees and stuff. I actually didn't. I did them both online. Um, I, mm -hmm. So I stayed in Florida the whole time. And the reason that I did them online was when I got, when I started that master's degree that had a focus in nonprofit management and leadership, it was early enough, uh, gosh, I guess probably eight years ago now or so, it was early enough that not a lot of universities had that specific degree. You could get an MBA, but there wasn't a lot of places that had the focus on nonprofit leadership. They were just sort of beginning. So I found New England College, um, and it actually worked really well for me because I could not only do it on my own time, but I got to learn from other nonprofit professionals in New York, Chicago, Hawaii, parts of Canada. Uh, so I, I felt like I gained even more perspective on non, the nonprofit industry by doing it that way than I may have sitting in a classroom here locally with um, people that I work with every day. I know you're an avid blogger. So you're taking all that that you learned and much experience as well, because you work with nonprofits on a broad yes. scale and you put it into wording and that takes you across borders. It really yes. does. And I've Absolutely. enjoyed many of your blogs. Thank you. And um, they trigger they trigger questions for me and uh, they're easy to find, you know, just type in your name and boom, mm -hmm. I'm reading another blog from you. Um, <laughs> what are some of your favorite subjects to pursue in your writing? 
I, uh, if, if you've read anything of mine, you know that I'm very conversational and straightforward. You never really have to wonder how I feel about something. I, I just put it out there. And one of my, one of the things I think is really important to talk about is educating boards in the fact that fundraising not only is a profession, but there is a, a, a whole strategy to the relationship building behind fundraising. So it's sort of that intersection between coaching fundraisers um, and the uh, the steps that we all take to do what we do um, and working with boards to understand the full scope of it. So when I when I blog, it tends to be in, in those two areas. Now, you really are hands on in your fundraising as well as in your leadership training. I, I as I was doing research for this conversation, I kept seeing this tug between being a successful specialist in fundraising and being a trainer that is able to really ascertain problems within teams and help mm. them break through those problems. What do you like doing more? Do you like the the successful fundraising side or the being the leader training? You know, I, I like them. I like them both. Um, and, and I know that sounds answer. that sounds like a cop out answer. I know, but um, I think that when I coach fundraisers and I work with fundraisers and help them do appeals and talk to them about things like what you do, you know, bringing um, diversifying funding streams and uh, communicating through different channels, um, I like to see them grow. But I think it's important to realize that fundraisers themselves, the professional, they don't, they can't operate in a vacuum. They can't do it by themselves. So mm -hmm. unless the executives of the organization and the board really do understand the culture of philanthropy and understand what the fundraiser can and cannot do, um, then that fundraiser can't be as successful. So that's my that's the the rationale for my cop out answer of I like both of them. <laughs> the one question I get emailed and asked the most is, David, do you have what's the latest thing when it comes to fundraising? Do you have any fundraisers that that you seem to work with other people? And it's a very ambiguous question because it really has to do with with community, has to do with the size and strength of the organization, resources the or organization already has. So I always have to, you know, hedge it in that. But there's always a few fundraisers that off the top of my head, I said, well, if you do this, marry it with this, you're going to have success right now because this is the way people are communicating. Do you have any off the top of your head? You can say, David, we're starting to see some success with these types of fundraisers right now. I think that we are. There are. Um... I think during the pandemic over the last two years, one good thing that has come out of it for nonprofits is that the smart ones have taken the time to learn more in their craft um, about fundraising and um, think about different types of fundraising. Here in my region, special events rule all. Um, and I do not generally suggest special events because you know they have a very high cost to raise a dollar, uh, so they're not terribly efficient, but special events are huge here. So I've been impressed by the nonprofits who've used the time to diversify the way that they communicate and stop thinking in terms of galas and start thinking in terms of how do we identify who is on what platform how they want to be communicated with and how we reach them there without just over overstretching ourselves and, and trying too much and trying everything out there. So I've um, worked with a couple nonprofits um, and seen nonprofits who have ha been successful at bringing what they do into focus on the mission, tying everything to the storytelling, tying everything to the impact. So whether it's a a hybrid event, whether it's bringing a speaker in on the topic, um, whether it is peer-to-peer um, -peer fundraising where people are telling their own stories and raising money for the organization, those types of things are really working because people need to need you need us as nonprofit organizations to be available where they are. 
I uh, I know I write about it in demystifying fundraising funnels. There are certain nonprofits that are young. They've, mm-hmm. they've got leaders that understand uh, social media. Yes. And they have chosen to forego all other forms of fundraising except for a particular one and becoming really good at it because they're like, we, we can't do everything, but we can do Facebook and or they can do Instagram. And they just keep dialing into that more and more and more. Uh, there's one in particular I talk about in the book raised over one point um, five million dollars in one year just doing Instagram and uh, wow. Facebook. And now it's an unusual uh, strength, but they yes. everyone on their team basically taught themselves Instagram and really started pushing their message on Instagram and results of that. I I know. Uh, if you, have you heard of Meals on Wheels over there, yes. Florida? Absolutely. Okay, so Meals on Wheels in San Diego was an organization I was involved with for a number of years, and uh, they're a well-run organization. They get one fundraiser a year that really is the grand poupa, like a lot of nonprofits. It's, it is this big celebrity dinner that they do. It's uh, Okay. And people come, the mayor shows up, police the chief shows up, everyone in San Diego that um, if, from Colorado, Coronado Island, everywhere shows up mm-hmm. at the this event and they basically raise their majority of their budget at this event per year. Mm-hmm. So 2020 uh, hits and they had to cancel it. Now they need that or people go hungry, right? There are people yes. that are shut in that need meals on wheels to feed them. And so they're like, what do we do? And I was in a uh, zoom call and they're like, we're in a position we're nine weeks out from doing this event. Mm-hmm. And yet we can't hold have it in a room at all so what what do we do and and um we spent all this money even putting on the event so broach the subject why don't you do it as a webinar do a zoom webinar and still do the meal and everyone eats in their own homes and watches on zoom together and they created a zoom community they started pushing into a webinar zoom and doing the entire meal and the celebrities all brought it came in from their their locations and they raised 23% more wow. in that fundraiser than they'd ever done before in history. That's a, that's shocked. truly impressive. Yes. Yeah. The organizations that were able to change in that way, I, I uh, encountered several that did what you're talking about in terms of moved events online, but then they would have maybe a celebrity chef or a local celebrity chef do a cooking lesson. Um, I work with a um, an urban farm and they delivered ingredients to all the people who had bought tickets to the in-person one. And then they had a celebrity chef come on and teach them how to make the dinner. So everybody was still there. Everybody was online. They were raising funds, um, but they were able to take advantage of that and not lose everything by not being able to do the farm to table dinner that they had planned. That's brilliant. I love that. It was. It was very creative. All right. I'm going to go with another one. Then it's your turn again. Let's see if we can write okay. this. All right. <laughs> so talking about really small, going micro here. Yeah. Um, uh, we have our children grew up going to youth group and being involved in youth events and, uh, you know, local sports leagues. And the big thing they always did was their car wash, right? Mm-hmm. I am assuming car washes are a big thing in Florida because for, it's, it's for schools. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So their youth group had about 15 kids in it. And as a rule, they'd raise about three to $500. And they do like three car washes a summer, right? To raise money for mm. something they're doing, youth camp or something like that. Right. So he takes a digital marketing funnel. This is, this is awesome. He takes a digital marketing funnel and he sets it up and pre-sells tickets to, for car wash for a donation. Give us a donation above 25 bucks. Take this ticket. And then he put an upsell in there for the bake sale. So you can pre-buy the goods in the bake sale. Mm -hmm. And he ends up making almost $4,500 in a single car wash. It took Ah, him two hours to set up that that funnel, Mm -hmm. uh, that online funnel. He said half the people didn't even show up to get their car washed. And then the ones that they did, they still had a donation bucket at the end. And they gave again in the donation bucket. Yes. Uh, He said it's the only way he's ever going to do it ever again. I, I found that organizations that that change to something like what you just described 
also were successful if they added a text to give component. So if they had that available to them and the cars did show up and there just happened to be a sign that said while they're waiting to get their car washed, text to give this, then they were able to raise even more that way and start to get those, um, those donors and potential supporters comfortable with maybe a new method of giving that they hadn't tried before. That is <laughs> awesome. I love that. I great. hadn't even thought of that one for a car wash. Wow. So, I, I uh, worked with an organization who, um, it was a campus of nonprofits and they had an event scheduled that obviously they weren't going to be able to do uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So they talked to the county and um, got a park and they had all these corporations put up uh, holiday lights, different displays. Um, and then we had it set so that they put signage all the way along. It was a drive through. You go in, you donate, you drive through, you look at the lights. We had signage all the way along about the mission, what, what you're actually looking at this for, who's benefiting from this. But then we had text to give signs all the way along and they raised $1,200 through an event. It sounds like it's a relatively small amount, but it's a, one, a small nonprofit. And it was a totally new thing that they just tried to see if they could um, uh, change uh, in a way during the pandemic and they were able to do it really well. And because of that, you know, when people give text to give through donor management systems and giving pages, then those nonprofits have those new contacts that they can then work to build relationships with and hopefully bring those people into the family of their nonprofit and make them um, believers in the mission and people who really care about whether that mission succeeds. That's really good. Uh, we have just moved in the last two years to this part of central Washington. My wife needed to come home. Her parents um, are not uh, physically doing great. And so she wants to be there for them. Uh, she has an identical twin sister that uh, they're very close. And her sister's like, this is a team effort. So, you know, we, <laughs> we sold need to do this together. Yes. Years. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I hadn't been here for 30 years. Uh, when I married Michelle, uh, we had come in. I was being in music. I'd been in a band. Um, There's a church she was attending. They asked, I ended up getting involved and uh, with a youth group. And there was a little redhead 13-year-old girl in youth group, which to this day, I don't really remember her. But she remembers me being in the youth group and helping uh, that over that year that I was there. Fast forward 30 years. Crazy, right? Uh -huh. It's a lifetime. I'm I move here to town. I basically just getting everything settled in, and I go on a business call to a local orchard where they're selling a lot of manufactured goods. And I walk into there, and I'm thinking about the connection between what we're doing here, um, social media, and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I hear this question from behind me: "Is is that you, David?" And I turn around. I'm looking at this. 40 year old redhead lady. And I go, hello, do I know you? She goes, are you David Higgins? And I go, yes, I am. And she goes, oh my goodness, it's been 30 years. You stand just like you did when you're, you know, I'm like crazy. Okay. <laughs> she goes, my husband and I just moved here uh, four months ago and became the pastors of this little church down the street. And of course she invites me to come to the church. And mm -hmm. you know, so I decided I'd just show up one Sunday. Wasn't doing anything else. There's no football to watch. I decided to go visit the church. So I pop in there. Michelle's like, where are you going? He says, I'm going down to visit this church. She goes, who are they? Why? Why are you doing that? And I'm like, right. I met this girl and that that her and husband pastoring from, and I, I, I want to. So I show up there. Her husband, a great guy, right? It was a... a just a really friendly church. It wasn't any show. It was just people being people. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end, he goes, what do you do? And I told him, I, and he goes, is there anything you do that could help us? And I said, There's about 45 people in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Small, small, 45 people, community church. And I said, do you guys have a Google ad grant? He's like, what's that? So we went and had coffee that week. I told him about the Google ad grant. I said, it's $10,000 a month of free advertising, but your website and who you are as an organization has to meet a certain criteria. Mm -hmm. I said, one of them is you got to be willing to love everybody. As a church, if you're not willing to love everybody, you can't get it. He goes, 
we love everybody. And I said, okay, <laughs> as long as you're willing to stand by that, then go ahead and have a look at the Google ad grant. So he goes on, he looks at it. He goes overnight. He asked me what he needs to do to change his website. I tell him he become, makes it a really great website, engages people. He applies for the Google ad grant. Three days later, he gets it. Nice. He starts, he, that, this was uh, just this last year in uh, November. He takes it. He puts it to work. $10,000 worth of free advertising for his mm -hmm. Christmas community stuff. And by the time they got to that time, they were running 80, 85, 90 people coming into service. And that's um, terrific. Because he started communicating. So we did a, our organization did a survey. There is 117 churches in the Yakima region, this, this part of the county. There is 227 nonprofits. We put a line between um, the faith nonprofits and the secular nonprofits just because they operate through a different psychology. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at who, how many of them got the Google Ad Grant, what they're doing with it. There wasn't a single church that applied for the Google Ad Grant. Not a single really? one of them. Out of them, there's only 13 websites that are current and only three that was using social media effectively. And so I just, I called him up. I said, I just want to let you know these statistics. The next week, he got all of his youth group in there and they started trying to have a voice where no one else was talking. Now, this is a smaller, more conservative town. So it's not, um, you know, the bigger cities have a, a nonprofits really pushing this area maybe more effectively. But it was really encouraging for me to see a small nonprofit that really didn't know, turn around and put those things to work and then start thriving in it. And they, it, because they embraced it and were willing to try it. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just realized I'm telling stories and they're actually, I want you to tell stories. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm enjoying your stories. I like uh, talking with other people who care as much about helping nonprofits. I call it do good the right way. You know, it's like mm -hmm. we all want to do good, but we need to know what the the tools are that can help us do that. So I enjoy uh, conversations with people who also uh, try to do that. Well, I want to get to a point where you're teaching us some of the things you know, because a lot of people, the listeners hear my stories all the time. So <laughs> I want to look at three things that you have identified mm -hmm. that nonprofit leaders must embrace in order to transition from a crisis operations mode to systemic success in their future growth mm -hmm. and how to change not just the psychologies, but the actually how to get their hands in the process of that, that mm -hmm. um, work. So I, I wrote down a couple of questions. First one is how do we evaluate where nonprofits missions and service delivery methods actually fit? Organizations so often get stuck in, you described it earlier, they get stuck in this, this rut of just putting out fires all the time and they're just trying to survive every day. And to be able to stop doing that and move into a situation where they're operating at the optimal version of their organization so they can do the best for the community, they really need to take a look at themselves. You know, are they... Are they the right nonprofit delivering the right service in that community? Is there redundancy of services? If they've been delivering it for a long time, is there still a need for that service? We tend to assume that because we're a nonprofit and we've been operating that we should just do that. But if nonprofits are the safety net of society and we provide services to fill holes that are needed, we need to periodically assess whether those needs are still the same. So that is one thing um, that we should do. But we also then need to look at whether we have the capacity, whether we're looking at the right things. Um, are we periodically evaluating all of our functional areas, uh, human resources, programs, technology, facilities, and making sure that we know what the optimal version of operation in those areas would be. Um, and to do that, organizations really need to keep up with their strategic planning. Um, now, it, it always has been three to five year strategic plans, um, but many nonprofit organizations, I don't know if you've encountered this um, this last couple of years, 
have started doing short-term ones, 12 to 18 month strategic plans to make sure they can get through what's happening now, but then revisit to plan for the next steps so that they make sure they don't either stay in crisis operations mode or um, to make sure that they are in fact evaluating what the market is shifting to and what the community needs are shifting to so that they can address those. Uh, it takes it takes a strong nonprofit that's willing to really look at themselves and why they're doing what they're doing um, and make changes if it's necessary. What are some of the things when it comes to short term uh, uh, planning? Mm -hmm. You know, that 12 to 18 windows, some of the things that we really need to bring into consideration. The the things that very often when I meet with boards, uh, the first thing they'll say is we need to raise more money. But in reality, there's a whole other group um, set of things that need to happen first. Infrastructural things that make the organization appealing to donors um, and put them in a scenario where they are able to raise that money. Uh, a couple of those things are, um, one is your staffing. So many nonprofits pay at a rate that their own employees actually need the services of other nonprofits because they can't afford to live on what they're making. We have this, we live by this fallacy that because somebody works in the nonprofit industry, they've committed to living in poverty themselves. And that that is, that is absolutely needs to go away. Um, nonprofit work is just as professional as any other industry. So um, in terms of that type of planning and evaluating your own organization, it takes sometimes a shift for the executives and the board to start planning strategically to be able to afford to attract and maintain staff, the appropriate staff at the appropriate level. Um, so that is one thing. Uh, the other big thing is being able to articulate the reason that the nonprofit exists, um, what need it meets in the community, and what resources financial or otherwise, they need to be able to deliver on mission and affect, uh, have big impact in the community. Um, we call it a, a case for support. Um, but very often nonprofits, they just, they do what they do. They're, they, they're on the treadmill. They know what, what they're delivering. But if you ask five different people, board members or staff at that organization, what the organization does, you'd probably get five different answers because we all focus on the part that's of interest to us. So, you know, in one, in one organization, somebody might focus on the mentoring component. Somebody else might focus on workforce readiness. Uh, somebody else might focus on internet access. And it's all under the same umbrella at the same organization. But what, what we need as nonprofits is to be able to pull that together into main talking points of, articulating the reason that we exist and what need we meet in the community. And when we can do that succinctly and in an emotionally compelling way, then we've really made our case for why people would want to support the organization and help the organization deliver on missions right on a regular basis. I, uh, I was offered a full-time position with a nonprofit. Um, and I left a very secure position and accepted it. This is in my mid twenties. Mm -hmm. And the first question they asked me was, you know, do you really believe in our mission our, and what we're trying to do is absolutely. I says, how much, uh, what, what am I getting paid? And there was like, what do your receipts come to? <laughs> I was like, well, wow. I've never asked that question. I mean, not getting a job interview before. Yeah. But I told them what my Michelle and I, we had a, two kids at the time, is this is what our receipts came to every month. And so that's what they paid us. All right. And there was that, and it left us 
it, at a point where we had to depend on others just to make it right. Mm-hmm. The only way I got Christmas presents to the kids was doing side jobs and night jobs type of thing. And, and there was a point where I accepted that as reality. It's like, right. you know, this is, we're doing it for the mission. We're doing this because we're helping people. We're doing this because people, you know, can't help themselves. So we're putting ourselves in that position to, but it became an unhealthy way of thinking where yes. it became, well, this is what it's like to work for a nonprofit. And it wasn't until several years later that somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, David, what are you doing? I said, Wait, just why are you doing school. that? <laughs> This is this is the way that other the previous generation did it. And they said, "There's no business sense in the way you're running your nonprofit. That doesn't make sense." I said, "Well, it's not a business; it's a nonprofit." They said, no, and, and I had the biggest lesson of my life. Like they had to break chains off my brain. Of yes. you run your nonprofit as a business, yes, um, and then as a healthy business, you're able to accomplish your nonprofit. Uh, yes. And that that mentality that you're describing is really hard to break because it's pervasive throughout our communities, even in the fact that, you know, many grantors uh, won't, you can't use their grant for anything to do with overhead or uh, staffing or anything like that. And somebody, I heard like the best description of it um, that basically said, you know, grantors choosing, I only want to fund this, but we won't allow you to use the money for this is sort of like saying you want to get a hamburger, but you'll only pay for the meat. You won't pay for the cheese or the bun. So the person can hold the, hold the hamburger, but they don't get the rest of it. And that that's very true because it's, it's really holistic. You know, you, you know, you were the expert in that, that nonprofit, you were delivering the services but if you don't have the resources you need to live as well and aren't compensated at a level that makes sense for the skill that you're bringing to it, then what that does to employee morale is, is not good. And then you end up with employee churn at nonprofits. And we deal with that all the time. And so many nonprofits, unless they're a little bit bigger, um, they don't calculate what the cost is for recruiting training that employee churn so they 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 don't necessarily take the the mental leap to if we paid more appropriately and had more appropriate benefits then we would be paying less in turnover retraining recruiting etc uh, and the time that it takes to do that so there is a whole mentality around um the nonprofit profession and uh, the fundraising profession itself that that really does need some re-education. Frank Brown Esquire, I got a chance to interview him a month ago. Uh, He is the director for Community Schools of Atlanta, and they just had the largest uh, unrestricted gift given to them of any nonprofit in the last year. They've made such a noise that CBS, this happened just a week ago. CBS uh, got a hold of him and um, the president of the board. They interviewed them and they're just shocked. And it was a, it's a billionaire who remains nameless who gave them an unrestricted one $180 plus million dollars. Unrestricted. Phenomenal. It's unheard of, right? And the big question was why did he make it unrestricted? And the response, he didn't, he spoke through a lawyer because they asked them, why is this unrestricted? He goes, you are a charity. We have went through a deep vetting of everything you do. And we trust you that what you're doing is what's for the best interest of the people you're doing. And so if we're going to trust you and give us our money, we're going to trust that you're going to use the money the yes. best way for your people. And that's not us to decide, it's for you to decide. What's going to make your charity run the best it can. And so once a year, this particular billionaire looks at all the charities in America and they pick one and it mm-hmm. meets the highest of their criteria and they give this un the shocking gift to them. Yes. But in it, I something clicked in my brain. I was like, they understood that if they're giving to a charity, it's because they trust the charity to do what's yes. best. 
and that and doing it just takes all the chains off and allows the charity to really throw themselves at accomplishing what that gift was there for. Yes, absolutely. And and I'm sure you've encountered it as much as I have in the last year or so that there really is a movement in the nonprofit industry going in that direction that um, if grantors and, and large major donors are going to give big gifts to nonprofits, they they need to trust those nonprofits to do what they do. They're 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 down, you know, um, uh, on the streets doing the work. Um, and it's it's about not having funders or um, boards or committees making decisions in a vacuum over here about what this nonprofit should do with the money, because how could they possibly know each piece of what that nonprofit actually needs? So I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing when that we're moving to a point where if we're relying on these nonprofits to do this incredibly important work, regardless of what it is, whether it's education, arts, social services, whatever that important work is, if we trust them to do it um, and we um, support them in a number of ways, then we should also believe that they are capable of determining what they need. They're able to evaluate their own capacity and make a plan for what they need to make it go forward. Um, now, you know, yes, the the executive staff may make that plan and the board may evaluate it and approve it, but it's all people that are involved on a regular basis with that nonprofit making decisions about what is best for them in terms of the resources that they need and where funds need to be spent. So that's a, it's a terrific shift. I think it's probably going to take some, a number of years to, um, to really filter into the whole industry, but it's great to see it starting. We know how important systems are in the administrative flow of an organization. Going back to where I introduced this entire conversation, mm -hmm. what is the difference between being built for crisis or being built for success? I um, I started my fundraising career at American Red Cross. So we, we you know, obviously it's a lot of really uh, crisis motivated and episodic response. Um, so though the organization had to run all year long, a lot of the focus was on these, these episodes. Um, so for me, I always sort of keep that in the back of my mind when I'm looking at nonprofits and, and working with them of, um, of and, and working with them to stop focusing right here in front of them and just what they're going to do to survive until tomorrow um, and start looking out there, sort of like when you drive right? When you drive, you don't look, you don't look, watch the road right in front of your hood. You watch the road a couple car lengths down because that's what you need to do to be able to drive without crashing into things. Um, nonprofits really need to be the same way. We need to get out of operating right here and um, start focusing on what we should be doing um, a couple car lengths down the road. Um, and and to do that, it, it does take a um, sort of a philosophical shift a lot of times, and and it can be a hard thing to to pin down because when you have boards of directors, whether there's eleven people on it or twenty people on it, working with nonprofit staff, and you need all of those people to agree on what that strategic direction is, it, it does take some. Um, some some conversation and compromise and that can be quite a process to get everybody on the same page agreeing with what direction the organization is going to go um, but in terms of also not just operating um, in crisis mode but planning for the future fundraising specifically uh, in, with regard to fundraising to me, it's all about diversifying funding streams. Um, it's 
you described uh, one organization a little bit ago that did all face Facebook and Instagram. And that's cool. It's a really neat story. However, most organizations we would look at and say, that's wonderful. Now, how do we bring those donors, those social media donors closer into the organization? How do we build relationships with them? Um, how do we get them interested in the mission so that we can build relationships and potentially increase the level in which they interact with the organization as opposed to just having um, transactional relationship with those people. So um, to get out of the just operate now mode and go into the future, it takes creating, uh, building the infrastructure underneath your fundraising program that has the resources that are necessary to technological resources, human resources that are necessary to expand your fundraising to be able to meet people through these different channels. And I know um, that's one thing that you do. I think you call it funnel flow is, is all these different channels um, being used in a way that um, brings the mission uh, and the, the impact stories to people um, through different avenues so that we're reaching everybody where they are as opposed to where we're comfortable, where we've always been, what we've always been doing. Absolutely. In, in using social media, for example, my relationships on LinkedIn, which actually mm -hmm. where you and I met, yeah. is very different than my relationships on Facebook. Right? Yes. And then my email list is very different relationships from either of those. Yes. And, and if I limited just to one, I am limiting my ability to connect the network into that area with that, those types of people on Facebook are Absolutely. very much long-term friends, right? People mm -hmm. that have met me at concerts, met me at um, conventions that I spoke at. The people on LinkedIn are my network of, of peer professionals in many regards. Mm -hmm. And and then and you on um, email, they're very much customer base, right? So mm -hmm. in the nonprofit world, we have different networks that we can engage in. And though I did use that for an example, I, I absolutely agree with you. Right. If, <laughs> if something happened in that one niche, they're going to be stuck. They're yes. going to have to reinvent themselves. And they don't have any forward momentum in those other areas. So yes. I absolutely agree. I always, I always uh, at, suggest, oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. no, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I suggest not having any one funder or any one type of fundraising uh, account for more than 33% of your budget. If you're, if you are relying 100 or 90% or 80% on one thing and something goes wrong, your organization can implode. But if you're not account, you know, if, if you're um, keeping it to under a third of, um, of revenue, then other areas can, can pick up um, the slack. I have just one last question before we start kind of winding down mm -hmm. our conversation here. We, we've been having fun. I, fact, I think I could talk to you for another hour. <laughs> Yes, we did sort of go all over the place. <laughs> and nonprofit systems are vital to accomplishing its mission. You help nonprofits drill down and focus on their mission. What are the systems of success we can create as nonprofits to maximize our success? Um, I think that there are some standard things that need to happen. Um, that need to be the, the the baseline, the infrastructure that lives underneath all the work that we do so that we can be successful. Um, we talked earlier about a culture of philanthropy that, and, and that sometimes sounds like an overused term, but it, it's really true in that the belief in fundraising um, and the importance of fundraising has to start with the executive, um, executive director or executive team and the board of directors and then permeate every level of the organization. Even the program staff, everybody needs to understand that fundraising is not more important than anything else at the organization, but it needs to be intertwined with everything in the organization so that it can be done effectively. Um, and so that it can be um, commingled with content 
that you're sharing out about your organization, about your mission, um, so that it's not just all content or all fundraising so that the two can can be married. Um, planning is incredibly important. Um, we talk, you and I have talked today about a number of different types of fundraising, you know, email, direct mail, uh, person to person, major gift asks, social media, text to give, all of those things. But um, it's not effective for, especially small and mid-sized nonprofits, just to like try everything all at one time and see what happens. Having a development plan um, in place, looking at how have we raised money in the past? Look at the past three years. Um, what have we done? What have we raised? And then use that information to inform how you're going to um, do it going forward. Um, and some evaluation to that of, um, you know, you mentioned uh, different audiences on different platforms. When we are communicating by email or direct mail, uh, in our donor management systems, we very often have different groups of people, people who've been supporting for forever, um, people who used to be clients and um, are now supporting in different ways. Um, young supporters who came to us through an event, we have the ability to, to segment those and to target our messaging and our storytelling to each of those different types of audiences. And it's really important in terms of um, our, our ability to be successful, that we do that, that we don't just blanket the world with all one message and hope something sticks. Um, so having, having a development plan, um, report, uh, understanding what the right performance indicators are, you know, how, how are you measuring success? You know, is it by 10 calls a day or is it by how many donors we have, how many uh, have increased their gift this year, how are we increasing our traction in one particular channel. We really need to evaluate what we're doing and the success of how we're doing it. I'm, I'm a big proponent of any type of fundraising you do, um, you need to run the, you know, the, the, the ROI on it afterwards or the cost to raise a dollar. However you evaluate it, make sure that it's efficient and effective um, along with um, a, a positive way to, to engage your audience. And then policies and procedures. Uh, a lot of nonprofits don't necessarily think about the policies and procedures, but something as simple as a gift acceptance policy, having that in place can make, um, can, it can stave off a lot of, of issues that might come in fundraising. So when, when you and I talk about Oh, having fires to put out all the time. Well, if you have the right policies and procedures in place, like gift acceptance policies, then some of those fires may not ignite to begin with. So you're not having to deal with them over and over again because you've already made that, that plan. Um, and then just being willing to evolve, um, being willing to realize that um, our world is changing uh, pan through the pandemic, through um, social and uh, racial unrest in, in at least in the United States, um, and through different philosophies about how people are interacting with nonprofits and giving to nonprofits. So if we as nonprofits are paying attention to that and we're willing to, to learn about it, to listen, and to try to evolve, then we're, we're going to have the staying power and we're going to be doing a good job for the right people in the right way. That was really good. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Tracy, there is uh, a lot of nonprofits that actually need to talk to you. How is the best way for them to reach out to you and your organization? Uh, they can find me on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram at uh, Philcom, P-H-I-L-C-O-M, S-R-Q. Uh, which is the airport area, the airport code for, <laughs> for this area that I'm in, Philcom SRQ. Um, and, or you can, uh, my website is uh, phil, P H I L dash com, C O M dot com, phil dash com dot com. And uh, you can, you can 
find my email and all my information there. And I'm, I'm happy to hear from anybody. I would love it. Well, we end every one of our interviews giving a shout out to nonprofits that we think are doing an amazing job. And, cool. and we try to, it's hard to limit ourselves to one each, but I, I, I've worked on it all week trying to figure out how to pick the one. And I think I've got my one. Do you have one on your end? I do. I do. Awesome. I gave right. it some thought this morning. Great. I'll go ahead and go first and then I'll toss it to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So I have was doing some research in Mississippi uh, this last week. And one of the things I always do when I start researching nonprofits within a state, I look at the top, the best run nonprofits in that state, the ones that are accomplishing mm -hmm. the mission, the highest rated um, within that region. And I kind of, I start seeing different names popping up on a reoccurring uh, search, you know, mm -hmm. different grouping, different searches. Then I, I noticed, though, when I, I got into top 10s on several groups, there's a particular nonprofit that kept emerging. But the funny thing is, I see different chapters of that nonprofit on top 10 lists in multiple states. Like two mm -hmm. months ago, I was searching through Texas and answering some questions for some nonprofits in Texas. So I'd done a bunch of research and I kept seeing different chapters of this same organization in the top tens in those. It's really well run. They really do a great job of not just managing their finances, but accomplishing their mission and really are trusted by their region. You know, it's one thing to say it's a national nonprofit with a national reach, but when they break themselves down to just yes. local areas and communities and those communities are still putting them in the top 10 for that community. Yes. That says something about a really well-run organization. So I want to give a shout out to Habitat for Humanity of Pine Belt, Mississippi, in Hattiesburg, nice. Mississippi. The Habitat for Humanity in Pine Belt is being recognized by multiple uh, different uh, searches, not just government uh, uh, lists, but as well as community lists, statewide lists, as one of the best run and most trusted nonprofits in the state of Mass, Mass, uh, Mississippi. So Habitat for Humanity in Pine Belt, congratulations, nice. you're my shout out for today. All right. Oh, and their URL is their national URL at habitat.org. All right. Well, you went macro on that. They're everywhere and they do really well at the at local levels, um, at, uh, particularly that one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit more micro on that one. Uh, a, an organization, local to Spartanburg, South Carolina. And uh, they're called Hub City Farmers Market. They are a small to mid-sized nonprofit that obviously is a farmer's market, but they also have an urban farm and summer camps, things like that. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, they ran all of those things, you know, perfectly well as a small and mid-sized mid nonprofit. When the pandemic hit, they were um, uh, the one of the organizations that stayed open. That the that even when everybody else shut down because they were food related, they stayed open. Um, they did so many things to um, offer to identify what the new needs were during the pandemic and to identify the fact that people who could give, could still give, were giving. You know, they, they weren't, they didn't have the fear of, it's, we shouldn't ask, it's crazy right now, we don't know what's happening. They, they realized people with means who are not as affected are still giving, and same with corporations. So they created a new program altogether that allowed corporations to donate um, bucks or, you know, uh, a farmer's market dollars. Um, they raised more than they've raised uh, through any other program in a short amount of time. And then those dollars were given out in communities that were into people who were most affected by the pandemic and they're not, you know, losing jobs and uh, people with medical bills, things like that. Um, and the way they did it enabled them to just give it to whoever needed it. They didn't have to go through this huge red tape of prove that you have need. Um, and they are actually the organization that I mentioned that did the, um, that um, they had a farm to table dinner scheduled um, and then they moved to making it a cooking class. They, they took um, all the, all the 
ingredients from their farm, put them in bags, had a local winery pair of wine that went with it, and they dropped it off to all the people that um, had been uh, registered to attend. And then they had a cooking class all together and they did their, their um, event that way. And then they also expanded um, the reach of their neighborhood food truck, their sprout truck um, for fresh greens, and, and ex were able to expand that through targeted fundraising um, to specific needs. So for a, a small to midsize local nonprofit, I really think they're, they were superstars of the pandemic for not just raising more money, but for identifying needs, telling their story, you know, bringing attention to the farmers, local farmers, um, so that they also benefited, and then um, uh, being able to deliver more on mission. And their URL is... Mm, hubcityfm.org. So hubcityfm.org. Yep. Fantastic. So I love how profits at Flex. I really yes, do. Yes, right? absolutely. They, they merge into that. Tracy, I have really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for being our guest. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed it too. And for all of you doing such an amazing job helping and serving in your communities, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your care. Uh, we need you and we're grateful that you are working so hard to helping other lives be able to reach beyond the barriers that are holding them back. Whether it's from pet rescues to civic organizations to even environmental groups, we are so grateful that you are there stepping in the gap. Thank you. Until we talk again in a few days, you have a great day.